All right. All right, we're just giving it about another minute. We're still seeing participants joining us. And it's just noon right now, so we'll we'll give folks a few, maybe a few more seconds. Um, I'd like to say hello to everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Bethay with the Aviation Council of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first engineering webinar of the year, Understanding PFAs at Aviation Facilities. Uh, we will be having regular engineering webinars throughout 2021, and I encourage you to check our events calendar for future dates. If you have a topic or suggestion for one of our webinars, please email us at info at acpfly.com. I also want to ask everyone to please save the date for our upcoming 41st Annual Pennsylvania Aviation Conference. This will be held October 26th through the 27th in Lancaster this year. Uh, please check our website for more information on the conference, including sponsorship opportunities. Uh, we'd like to thank today's webinar sponsor, McFarland Johnson. Uh, they've been a supporter of ACP over the years, um, from conference sponsorships to assisting with a, to assisting us with events. Uh, they are a valuable partner, and we thank them so much for their continued support. And now. I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, uh, Georgie Nugent. She is the Regional Environmental Division Director for McFarland Johnson. She will be taking your questions at the conclusion of her presentation. I'd like to ask each of you to use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions to Georgie. And she will be taking them at the as I said, at the conclusion of her presentation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our fabulous presenter, Georgie Nugent. Take it away, awesome. Georgie. Hi, thank you very much. Thanks, Mary, um, and to the Aviation Council for inviting us to speak today. Happy to be here. Um, we have quite a diverse group of attendees um, with, it seems, the entry level to expert level of this emerging topic of PFAS. So this presentation isn't going to be an exhaustive evaluation of PFAS. It's more to be meant to be just an overall um, overview. So we have a general sense of how it's affecting the aviation in industry and a better understanding of this emerging issue as we navigate through it. Um, as you listen, I encourage you to be creative in your thoughts and how you can be proactive with this emerging topic. Uh, please hold your questions to the end. We'll do a Q&A session. Um, this presentation is being recorded, so just a, a heads up. Um, and I look forward to the Q&A at the end, and it should be a good session. Um, and please follow up with me if you have any other comments or suggestions. I'd love to hear from you. Um, just a little bit about myself. I did grow up on the Pennsylvania-New York border, and I have distant relatives throughout the entire state of Pennsylvania. Um, and we have two offices in Pennsylvania and Du Bois and also in Pittsburgh. Um, I sit on the TRB, PFAS Task Force, and I'm also involved with the AAAE uh, PFAS Working Group. Um, very active group, does a lot of advocating, um, exposed to various developments conducted by the Department of Defense and the FAA, et cetera. Um, P MJ as a firm is really fortunate to be currently involved in this emerging topic, especially as it impacts our clients. So here's an overview of what we hope to accomplish today, a little bit of background of the PFAS, what, why are we hearing about PFAS and the AFFF, what's that connection, Something about the, a little bit about the regulatory 
environment, both on a federal and state level. Uh, how the aviation industry can stay ahead of this issue, how it may impact your, your facilities. We're gonna present a really interesting case study that's currently ongoing and happy to present to you. And then we'll do the Q&A, like we said. All right, so PFAS, a little background. I'm gonna make it quick here. I know you guys have, most of you have heard about this and know what it is and a little bit you know, of a background. But just, just to know, there are over 5,000 variations of this compound. Those ones listed right there are the ones that are really in the spotlight, especially as it pertains to the aviation industry. They are human-made fluorinated organic compounds, high degree of chemical and ther thermal stability. So they don't go away. They persist in the environment. They don't break down. That's why we're finding them over long periods of time. So a little bit about the potential health effects. Uh, they've found issues with developmental effects in fetuses, possible effects on the thyroid, liver, kidneys, and hormone levels, and the immune systems. Um, they have also found that there's a can cancer risk associated with people um, exposed over that health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion. Um, it should be known there is still no federal uh, drinking water regulation or standard. 70 parts per trillion is the health advisory level. And to put that in perspective, one parts per trillion is about the equivalent of one drop of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. So PFAS are really found everywhere. This is important, especially when you're dealing with an aviation facility who have, may have upgrading other potential sources migrating onto the airport facility and protecting you know, your, your best interest, especially the airport properties. Um, they're found in military facilities, dry cleaners, car washes, um, landfills, wastewater treatment systems. And they're also in everyday products that we use. You know, if you flossed your teeth this morning, you it, it is it, PFAS is found in dental floss, for example, your microwave popcorn. So be aware of the consumer products and also again the other property uses that may be impacting your airport. Um, what's unique about this and why I bring this up to what we're finding and some of the studies that are being done is that some AFFF have a signature. So there's, there are ongoing investigations on how you can differentiate um, the PFAS associated with AFFF versus a different type of property use. So why do we keep talking about AFFF and PFAS together? Um, you know, it, it is, AFFF does contain PFAS as we already discussed. It's been required by the FAA for use at commercial service airports, part 139, uh, for testing and training exercises and for emergency responses. Um, there's currently an estimate of over 500 airports throughout the US with potential PFAS impacts. And I wanna be clear, it's, it doesn't necessarily only impact the part 139 airports as well. Um, to date, FAA has not approved a fluorine-free fluorine foam agent for use, and there's still not a funding source available to pay for the investigation and remediation efforts associated with this on airport properties. This is really important, especially as we get go along further in, the, in this presentation and into our case study. So a little bit about the federal update, um, a lot of changes, as you all know, um, there's still a question, will EPA designate PFOA and PFOS? Those are two different compounds of the 5,000 that I earlier mentioned earlier as ha hazardous substances under CERCLA. Um, they have released an advance notice proposed rulemaking seeking comment right now. Um, so, you know, if you do want to provide some input on this, um, it, it is open and available to do so. Also this month, the EPA announced final determinations to regulate PFOS and PFO in drinking water and a proposal to require monitoring for 29 PFOS and drinking water under the fifth unregulated contaminant monitoring room well. Um, they, they also finalized some effluent guidelines program plan 14 and announced an advanced notice of rulemaking to collect, collect more data and info regarding PFAS manufacturers. 
and as they relate to affluent limitation guidelines for the manufacturers. Um, something else that uh, we was just announced, uh, the 2021 multi-sector general permit, the MSGP for industrial stormwater discharge does not include requirements for PFAS, but the guidance does document that they may or may not include them for some spe sector specific properties. So yet to come. This is a, a map that was recently updated, I guess, December, 2020, um, found in the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council website, a great resource for all things related to PFAS. This map, if you showed this two months ago, it would have been drastically different. A month from now, it will change again. The states are, changing drastically in what they're doing and how they're confronting this issue, since there is no federal guideline or regulatory requirements currently. So this is a 2019 study that I pulled from the Pennsylvania DEP, Bureau of Safe Drinking Water, where they identified airports, runways, and landing strips in Pennsylvania. And it also includes the 16 part 139 airports highlighted in red there. So what they did with this study, and I know many of you are familiar with this, this, this is actually a graphic from the PFAS Action Team initial report, which was in 2019. They identified approximately 400 drinking water samples that were collected from public water systems statewide. And they also identified several public water system wells within a half mile of airports and four miles within a half mile of the part 139 airports. The complete results of this study are located on the Pennsylvania DEP website. Um, it, need, it should be known too that there are over a million private water wells in the state of Pennsylvania. They were not included in the study. Um, and our, our case study actually goes more into the a private water drinking well um, issue impacted by PFAS. So I did want to bring that up. PennDOT action, some recent um, events, they developed a foam inventory survey completed by the commercial airports and railways. The intent of the survey was to help identify the locations of fluorinated foams and a database has been created with all of this information. So if you are in an airport that reported this information to the PennDOT, they are using it and analyzing it currently. Um, they're currently act, they're actively monitoring FAA's testing and non, of non-fluorinated foam and the development of a replacement from the current spec, specification at part 139 airports too. So PennDOT is actively involved in this matter. So a little bit of a snapshot for Pennsylvania and the ongoing legislation, a total of eight pieces of legis PFAS related Legislation have been adjourned in Pennsylvania since 2019 for various reasons, and one has been passed, the Transit Re Revitalization Investment District Act, which further provides declaration of policy and definitions, providing for military installation, remediation, and establishing the Military Installation Remediation Fund. I know many of you are familiar with that, so I won't go into much more detail, but we can follow up with questions and answers if we'd like to. There's one piece of legislation that is actively pending, that's the Land Recycling and Environmental Remediation Standard Act. So, you know, that all being said, it's important to know that although there have been few legislative actions thus far in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Safe Dr Drinking Water Act also gives the DEP the authority to take corrective action on a case-by-case -case basis to protect water systems when an unregulated contaminant is present and creates a risk of public health. Um, currently, there is no action plan beyond following the federal guidelines. So taking this all in and having this knowledge, how do we stay above the, the PFAS issues, knowing that you know, the federal regs may be changing, state regs as well? Um, we, we've our case study, we've got some really neat uh, lessons learned to share at the end, but these are some things that we're recommending. Establishing a PFAS support team, including your airport management, legal counsel is very important, consultants, um, environmental scientists, public outreach, outreach, outreach specialists, and any specialized sub-consultants that may need to, to be involved. P Developing a public outreach and media plan ahead of time is, is really key, um, just being ahead of the issue, especially if you know you're in upgrading from downgrade, potential downgrading receptors. Um, identify areas of potential 
a triple F use on your property. I'm going to get more into that later and keeping up to date with the regulatory requirements and remaining transparent once this takes hold. So initial due diligence at any deviation facility. First of all, I can't stress enough, engage legal, legal counsel before any testing begins and understand why you're testing. Is it you know, a requirement by a regulatory authority or something else? Um, identify the historic and current locations of AFFF in storage locations. That can be done you know, through interviews of current and past uh, aviation staff on the airport property, old documented records, how much you know, through purchasing records, things of that nature. E evaluate the potential receptor locations, you know, for private, public drinking water wells, things of that nature. Uh, again, understanding your local, state, and federal laws and regulations and how they're changing. Establishing the direction of groundwater flow and de developing a sampling plan and relying on some existing monitoring wells and drinking water wells on and off airport property if they're present um, are ways to uh, stay ahead of this issue and save some money in the long run. Again, legal is a must. Um, draw a firm line with advising the client. It's a very litigious matter and understand why you're, you're doing the sampling. So a few things that um, we need to discuss here, the planning design and permitting um, and hazardous substances, potential hazardous substances as this topic emerges. You need to design around it, disturb less, uh, disturb it less, plan for dealing with it. There may be unplanned costs associated with the proposed projects you may have on uh, on your airport property. Um, there may be delayed delays in construction, a loss of public trust, legal actions by injured prop parties, project planning, designing, and permitting, um, especially as it relates to your master planning, budget grants, and pr procurement options. Um, your agreements and things of that nature. So why hire a consultant to manage the process that they can best serve as the owner's representative to assist and select the best specialty subconsultants if needed. Um, this is such an emerging topic and you need expertise in all different levels. They can manage the investigation, remediation, re reporting requirements and work done by specialized subconsultants manage and lead the public outreach, act as a liaison with the airport management agencies and officials and public and media after this, um, this gets passed. You can also assist to identify funding sources. As I mentioned earlier, there's currently no funding source through the FAA. So they're, they're finding unique ways to uh, pay for this up, these upfront costs, but the consultants can certainly assist with that and then conducting the permitting and design needs, especially as they impact your future projects. So here, here's a little bit of lessons learned with the proactive public outreach component of this. Doesn't need a single point of contact when, uh, you know, when PFOS is discovered, you know, on the airport or off the airport, develop an outreach plan ahead of time, identify the stakeholders and how the outreach will be conducted identify any subject matter experts and legal counsel. So I can't stress that enough. I've said that a couple of times and I am not an attorney, so we rely heavily on them. Keep some key messaging in the public outreach. Human health is number one priority. We're committed to corrective actions. We're committed to ra rapid response. We're following the rules and the use of a triple F was required and still is by the, the FAA. Transparencies, rinse and repeat. So we're, I'm going to move into the exciting part of this presentation. This is a, a case study dealing with Nantucket Air, Memorial Airport. Uh, Nantucket is a 212 square mile island, just about 30 miles south of Cape Cod. The population on this island ranges from around 12,000 people to 50,000 people uh, during high travel months. It's a, you know, it's a tourist destination. And you're saying, well, how does this you know, relate to uh, Pennsylvania. So and what I'm gonna unfold here is kind of similar and but in different ways to what you're seeing, what's going on with the regulatory environment in Pennsylvania. Um, and believe it or not, I did a little research. Just, there's about 200 islands in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so a little bit about uh, the airport. It's a public airport located in the south side of the island of Nantucket. 
It's owned by the town and it is the second busiest airport in the state after Logan. It's about 1,200 1, acres and it was once used as a Naval Auxiliary Air Force facility training during World War II. So currently right now, we um, have two on-call agreements for consulting services with Nantucket Memorial Airport planning and engineering. Um, our aviation division secured these agreements in about May 2020. So during this time, the airport manager, Noah Carver, contacted us to assist with the ongoing PFAS investigation that I'm going to speak to in a little while. We were hired to manage the licensed site professionals. So in the state of Massachusetts, an LSP is required to manage these types of projects. This is, a, is such a large effort and it touches many aspects of the airport operations, planned projects, aviation advocacy, and 7460 work. And he made it a decision of, you know, on purpose to set it up in this manner. So this case study I am presenting today involves the four PFAS related projects. Uh, these are a few of the services that we're providing through ourselves and our subconsultants. All right, so to, to spell it out, you know, I mentioned the LSP. So PFAS matters are directed direct are by the Massachusetts Continuing Contingency Plan or the MCP rules. You'll hear that throughout the presentation with oversight by the MassDEP. So in an LSP-led state, the LSP has a major role in determining what is an appropriate use of airport revenue versus what is excessive, such as sampling outside of the MCP guidelines. And I, I do need to make a point that the MassDEP sent an initial RFI request for information in March 2019, requesting all AAA, AAAF usage records. And I spoke about that a little earlier when uh, the, the Pennsylvania airports were surveyed as well. This was prior to any legislation regarding PFAS was passed. So they came back and responded within a month. They, the airport uh, it responded by April 2019, just within a month of this request. They worked extremely hard in finding relevant documentation, interviewing staff to manage a full disclosure to the public and to the DEP. So they pulled records, they interviewed, things of that nature. This information tells the AFFF story at the airport. This is list is changing as more data is discovered, but it is definitely the best to, uh, to their ability where they've found these records so far. And we think it's pretty exhaustive and complete at this point. Uh, it is best to gather this accurately as possible. This information is shared publicly on the website and I listed that right there. So again, that issue I said about transparency, it, it is pretty important here. And I'll get into that in a little while. So here is a uh, aerial view of Nantucket Memorial Airport showing the AFFF release areas. Those are highlighted in the orange circles. The groundwater flow is represented by the blue arrows and they're showing obviously the groundwater flow heading towards the ocean. They created three areas of study for the purposes of the investigation, public outreach and remediation, because they're drastically different um, issues that we'll, we're dealing with there. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through a little bit about the timeline. I'm not gonna dwell on this, but it, it is important to notice how this kind of unraveled here. So January 2019, MassDEP announces their intention to initiate the process to develop the drinking water standard. They sent an RFI, like I mentioned, to Nantucket and they responded with all their AFFF use in March. And then a few months later in the end of December, this is important right here. They set a 22, 20, 20 parts per trillion as the cleanup level for groundwater consumption for private wells or the sum of six PFAS compounds. Notice how I said private wells. I didn't say public wells. So they started uh, collecting samples on, on, on and air, off airport property. Uh, there was one private water well located down gradient owned by the airport. 
and there were several several existing monitoring wells on the site, and that was requested through them by the Mass DEP. So MJ was brought in in May to help just manage the process and connect the pieces between the LSP, the client, and the FAA. Uh, we set up a website that went live to further inform the public of the investigation and the results in July, which was pretty quick. Um, we started doing additional sampling, the designing and permitting for the extension of the town water line to the to affected properties. I'm going to get more into that in, um, a little bit later in this presentation. So they in this October of 2020, Mass DEP then publishes the PFAS public drinking water standard of 20 parts per trillion as well. The source area investigation, uh, soil and additional water sampling started in November 2020. I showed you that map before and I'm going to bring it up again where all those orange dots are located, where they identified where AFFF had been used in testing, um, in uh, emergency training, that sort of thing. So currently, um, from December to present, we're continuing our public meetings, individual homeowner meetings, additional sampling and remediation, installing poet systems um, on individual homes. I'm going to get into a little bit of that later as well. So to date, we have collected more than 200 water samples from more than 70 identified private water wells. Three categories of results and actions are required under the MCP. Each requires notification of the homeowners and the provision of bottled water. Anything greater than 20 parts per trillion requires a remediation system to be installed at the residence. Um, anything greater than 200 parts per trillion is deemed an imminent health hazard by the Mass DEP. Um, and it has its own requirements. Everything needs to be done on an expedited basis, including immediate notifications. So what have we found so far? Um, as I discussed earlier, we have three separate uh, study areas that we identified for various purposes. Um, what's important here also is to identify, as I mentioned, the groundwater flow direction and evaluate whether there are other potential sources of PFAS. Um, we don't know that yet at this point. So as you can see around the nobody your way area, I'm going to start up at the top. Um, you have uh, some hits of PFAS detected in the private water wells. And I, did, I need, need to mention that all these, all these dots, the red, yellow, green, and purple, are pro indicate private water wells. So green are non-detect, yellow are non-detect to 20 parts per trillion, and red is 20 to 200 parts per trillion, and then the purple is that greater than 200 imminent hazard level that they have reported. And again, those orange dots are where known AFFF may have been used or released on the property in testing and training exercises. So I mentioned a little bit about the remediation system. This, um, these are currently being installed in individual homes that are affected. Uh, they're designed by the airport consultant and installed by the contractor. They have a redundant design to ensure the protection uh, the design is unique to each home. We do surveys based on their consumption, how often they're there, things of that nature. Each is very unique. As I mentioned, um, you know, it's a tourist destination. So a lot of these places get winterized. They are tested monthly, like on the intake, the midpoint, and also on the effluent to make sure that they're working properly. Uh, bottled water is provided to each of these homeowner, homeowners until the samples confirm the removal of PFAS. The cost for each one is approximately $14,000. That does not include the ongoing sampling and remediation of them, um, you know, taking care of them, the, the overall o &M. So another remediation uh, method that we're doing is we're working currently on the extension of a, the current, the existing, sorry, water line, town water line. The light blue indicates uh, where the existing water line is located, and the red is where we're proposing to extend it to service the impacted homes. The project one over there, there's an existing water, water main that is 
in close proximity to several, several of those residences. So we're actively involved in getting them individual hookups. The red line um, that's represented there is the overall extension. So we are working currently on the design permitting and bid documents to get that going this year. So a, a few things here um, that are important. We're identifying current and future projects to absorb the sampling and remediation costs. Um, currently, there, we have you know, a lot of work and money is being spent on the investigation, remediation, design, laboratory fees, drillers, the list goes on and on. The remediation cost is yet to be determined. Um, Nantucket Memorial Airport believes in legislative and organizational advocacy through organizations such as AAAE. And their opinion is that they will need, they will own and remediate the impacts, but the structure of state cleanup law requires that they spend a lot of resources under third party sources until we can prove that their involvement, which is problematic for recovering funds for airport rev revenue. So we're continuing on the waterline, like I mentioned, we're continuing the sampling and analysis and an inst installing of the POET system. Um, we're also working to identify the extent of the groundwater plume in coordination with the town, um, seeking some cost share directly from other identified responsible parties down the road. We're also working to determine a signature of the airport generated PFAS. That's currently undergoing and highly technical. Um, we've got a great LSP on board, Western Solutions, like I mentioned, who are uh, working actively to to see what the differences on, you know, various parts of uh, on and off airport property levels. And again, we're also continuing that public outreach and communication, and we regularly update with the website with anything that we do, um, any new result results that are uh, found or after we conduct the sampling, all the results are listed on that website. So uh, we're Getting near the end of the um, presentation, I do want to spend some time in the Q and A because there's a lot to be discussed here, and there's, you know, people of varying backgrounds um, on this presentation. It's just such a great topic to be coordinating with all of you. Um, I, I needed to mention, you know, it, PFAS. This issue is it, it's in the media. Um, PFAS. People drink water on a daily basis, we all use it. It's an emotionally charged issue. And you need to understand kind of what the public sees in pop culture and why it's such a hot issue right now. So dealing with uh, not just Nantucket, other projects and listening to friends and colleagues who have been working through this emerging issue of PFAS, I, we wanted to share just some actual lessons learned and kind of you know, in a way also kind of make light of the situation as it just unfolds in front of us. Our, an ideal PFOS team would be a CPA, a therapist, a crisis manager, a coach, a diplomat, and a politician. Obviously you need the aviation experts, the technical environmental scientists, public outreach specialists, and definitely an attorney. Understand the politics and relationships around your airport property. Um, impacted homeowners may also be the airport staffs, doctor, lawyer, accountant, babysitter. Politician and public figures all drink water. This is important. It is in the media. Build trust and be available. Um, calls and emails from impacted constituents come at all hours. This is really true. It, it's a heated issue, especially if the, these individual homeowners homeowners surrounding the airport properties are impacted and they've been using this water unknowingly contaminated with PFAS for years. So it's a moving target as well. You know, you, you get results back and it kind of changes the course of action. Um, it's highly technicalized. And so you, get, you need to understand that there, there will be a lot of changes to the scopes and fees that are put together and what you think, when you think you're going in one direction, it, it will go off course and you'll find something that you didn't know about. And there will be a lot of changes. 
And you know, subconsultants, contractors con cost money, understand your procurement requirements and understand that any of the, the consultants and subconsultants and contractors know this. And also very important, understand what is reimbursable by the FAA. Is it project related? So this is concluding my presentation. I'm gonna gladly open it up to um, a Q&A now. So I'd love to hear from you all. It sounds like we do have a few coming in already. All right, Georgie, we're working with seven questions right now. So we should have a, a really great conversation following up to your presentation. And um, full disclaimer, I, I may not be able to answer all of them, but you know, there are some very smart people on this call right now. So hopefully we can all chime in and have a, you know, a, a useful conversation here. All right, so Georgie, our first question. Are PFAs mobile in soils? So they are, it's dependent on the soil type, obviously, um, when you have a very sandy soil. Oh, there's someone who wants to answer it live. Oh, That's sorry, that, that might've been me, that might've been me. Oh. <laughs> Um, it, it depends on the soil type, but yeah, so, you know, especially as it rains or things of that nature, it does transfer and migrate through the soils and typically into the groundwater. It depends on the site setting. It, it's really specific to the site. Uh, is there an anticipated date on when the FAA will identify a fluorinated free foam for use by part 139 airports? So the original date was October 2021, but they have the FAA has acknowledged that that date is not attainable. So hopefully 2022. Uh, do local volunteer fire departments use uh, PFAs since they are sometimes included if there is an incident at airports? They do and they can. Again, not all do it's specific and you need to ask them. So, and a lot of them do have records and this information would be found in the MSDS's associated material safety data sheets. It would have the chemical compound breakdown of any AFFF if they are using that. You know, AFFF is very expensive. So a lot of the fire departments that we're seeing, you know, they only use it in heavy, really emergency situations when there's oil or some, you know, it's, it's an emergency situation, an explosion. Um, but people can also chime in and answer that if they have more information too. Uh, Georgie, where can the contaminated soil be sent? Can it be sent to a landfill? The overall answer is yes, not in every state. Uh, this is an emerging topic as well. It's very dependent on the state. So how it's being considered, um, some states are ca calling them hazardous materials or it maybe treated as such if they have not yet designated it as a hazardous material. So it's very specific to the state. I can't state that enough. Okay, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. What happens if the PFAS migrates onto airport property from other sources? And how do you differentiate that? So that, you know, there's a lot of work being done right now with the fingerprinting. I mentioned that a little bit. Um, we're seeing a real, uh, we, real differentiation between uh, the type of PFOS compounds um, associated with on, on airport AFFF versus whether it's from say a gasoline station that does uh, um, washing of, of cars on site as well, like um, car washes or even a dry cleaner, we're see seeing real variations of that. So it, it requires more investigation and sampling techniques and then plotting them out. We, we use, our, our sub consultant I did mention is using um, this, this analysis they call radar plots. And we are clearly seeing some differences between potential on and off airport properties. Uh Georgie, are you installing POET systems for private wells uh, in the ND to less than 20 PPT homes? We are not. Okay. Uh, another question, therapist, what role does a therapist fill on the PFOS team? 
That's a great question. Um, it, it was kind of a tongue in cheek, right? It's, you know, it, it is really an emotional issue because I did share with you, there are, um, you know, there's a lot of emotion that goes into this, right? When you have impacted homeowners downgrading, we hear this all over the place, it's in the media, um, it, it's, it gets very sensitive. Um, and you need to be, you know, acknowledgeable about the, the human nature of this topic and how sensitive it is, especially when you have homeowners with health issues and things like that, that may be impacted by PFAS, um, impacted water. Oh, yes. Um, will the property owners being offered a stipend for municipal water line connection to pay for the water that they previously had for free? not completely understanding that. So right now the airport is paying for the installation and the individual hookups. So when they were previously on um, their own well, they will now be converted to the town water and they will not be paying for that. Okay. Uh, is the airport going to pay for the water bills for those that are now going to be connected to public water? Good question to be determined. How that's to be different. Different. determined. Yeah, it's, um, there's a lot going on with that right now, so I can't speak to it completely. But this is, you know, the water line still isn't installed or designed yet, but there's a lot going on with how that's going to be funded and things of that nature. Georgie, do you know um, if the town of Nantucket has a consultant on board? And if so, do they have regular meetings with the town? So the town did hire a, a consultant to perform an um, island-wide PFAS investigation. The results of that study have not been finalized. Um, I'm not sure about the meetings that they attend, I've, um, but there are definitely a lot of stakeholders. Uh, when you talk about volumes of AFFF, are you talking about foam concentrate or foam diluted with water for application? What do you think about that? Foam concentrate. Yes. Foam concentrate. Yeah. Okay. I'm almost certain. Um, and this uh, is in regards to the POET systems. Uh, the question is, is it GAC or resin? GAC. Uh, is the water treatment system granulated, activated carbon? It is. And it's maintained and again, monthly sampling and it is changed out appropriately de dependent on the, the usage and each individual homeowner is totally different, their amount of usage and things of that nature. Uh, Georgie, how does the town of Nantucket oversee their airport commission's spending on the PFAs issue? And where is the current funding coming from? The current funding is coming from um, airport revenue and um, some bonding, taxes, that sort of thing. I could follow up with that. Um, it's, it, it's a complex issue. It, it sounds that way. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're funding it all themselves right now. Oh, oh. Um, well, there's only one more question and that's from me. Georgie, at the beginning of your presentation, you said there's PFAs and popcorn and floss. I guess it's more of a comment than yeah. a question. <laughs> microwave, microwave popcorn bags, the interior, that nice, you know, smooth, waxy material. How disappointing <laughs> for us popcorn eaters. <laughs> well, um, that is our last question. Um, Georgie, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, with, with all the flurry of questions we had, clearly, um, 
you you hit a nerve and, and sparked some interest. So thank you so much for your time today. And uh, if anyone has any other follow-up questions, uh, feel free to email us at info at ACPFly and we'll make sure we get your questions to Georgie for follow-up. So uh, thank you everyone and enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Georgie. Thank you very much. All right, take care. Bye.